www.thepetsdoc.com 24 hours a day, 7 days a week or call 1-800-854-6316. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so faith apart from works is dead. James chapter 2 verses 24 and 26. EWTN Live truth. Live Catholic. Mother Angelica Live. Brought to you from the Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. is our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. Thank you. Well, welcome, family. <clears throat> Tonight, you know, is family night. We're just going to kind of chit-chat. This looks kind of complicated, but it really isn't. I'm not going to read all this to you. Wouldn't be a bad idea, though, if you read it. But anyway, we're going to kind of chit-chat. I want you to call any time. I'm going to chit-chat here about some of the Vatican documents. Did you ever read one of these? No, you didn't read one of these. Did you ever read one of these? Nobody here read one of these? Well... This is the Vatican document. You've been hearing a lot about that. In fact, they blame a lot of things on this thing. You know, anywhere from sand in the holy water fountain to I don't know what, they blame on the poor Vatican Council. So I decided to get the books and read them to you. And then later on this evening, I'm going to tell you exactly where you can buy one. So tonight, we are going to talk about baptism. And I'm just going to read to you. It says, men and women. I'm glad they put the women in there, aren't you? Huh? I'm also glad they didn't take the men out. <laughs> I'm glad they didn't say all these persons. Anyway. <laughs> men and women are delivered by the from the power of darkness, delivered from the power of darkness through the sacraments of Christian initiation. We're delivered from something. Here comes this little baby here. Oh, there's a great chapter here. Where is it? Fantastic chapter on why infants should be baptized. It's wonderful. I'll just give you a little sampling. And you can buy this from the daughters of St. Paul. They die with Christ, are buried with him, and rise again. And after baptism, they are made a new creation through water and the Holy Spirit. And they are called God's children. Isn't that terrific? Are you excited because you're called a child of God? Did you ever wake up in the morning and say, ah, I'm a child of God? Most of us get up in the morning and say, oh, God. Where's, where's my coffee? Where's my coffee? We depend upon some thick black liquid 
to wake us up. God should wake us up. He's the one that should be filling our hearts and our minds. Early in the morning, no matter how we feel, you know, let the thought kind of roam through your mind. I am a child of God. See, I was, I was just a little baby, and then this beautiful thing happened to me. This wonderful sacrament. Now, signed by the giving of the same Spirit in confirmation. See, we're confirmed. They become more like our Lord and filled with the Holy Spirit. Isn't this beautiful? Oh, these documents are wonderful. They bear witness to him before the world. You know, the only thing I remember, and I can remember Sister Rita working hard on me, but my mind was 100 miles away at that time. And the only thing I remember is that Sister said, the bishop's going to slap you. And I thought, oh, what kind of a gift is that? And I went up there fear and trembling because I didn't want to be slapped. But all he went was that way. No, wasn't what I expected at all. But you see, at that time, I didn't understand that I received the third person of the Holy Trinity in a very special way to make me a witness. I was filled with the Holy You know, you hear a lot about being born again. Did you hear that today? All the charismatic friends are born again. Well, usually that means, most of the time, it means that they became aware of the power of the Holy Spirit, had a conversion experience. But see, Jesus took care of me way before that. He gave me baptism, and there I was born again. I became a whole new creature. See, at that moment... I could call God Father and mean it. My lack of understanding didn't, didn't take anything away. See, I, the Holy Spirit doesn't come to me because I understand. That's the power of the sacrament. See, that's the power of God comes upon me. I don't need to. This is why. Let's see what the church says here about infant baptism. The words children or infants are to be taken to mean those who have not yet attained the use of reason and consequently cannot profess personal faith. I was godmother for a, a little baby and uh, so it was very quiet except when they start pouring out water, you know, and yeah! So she didn't know what was happening to her. But I, as her godmother, know the church which was given the mission of evangelizing and baptizing has baptized not only adults, but children as well. From earliest times, it has always understood the words of the Lord. No one can enter the kingdom of God without out being born from water and the Spirit. This means that children are not to be deprived of baptism, for they are baptized in the faith of the church, see, proclaimed by their parents and godparents and everybody present. Well, that's this kind of go over what happens to us when we are baptized. Baptism, which is washing with water accompanied by a living word, cleanses men and women from all stain of sin, original and personal. Makes them sharers in God's life and his adopted children. See, what happened to me and to you? I was born and you were born in the image of God. 
What does that mean? It means that I have an intellect, I can reason, I can imagine, I remember. Do you remember all the things you remember? You think you forgot them, but as you get older, <laughs> you remember all kind of things that happened 20 years ago. You don't know what you had for breakfast, see? Short-term memory kind of decreases a little bit. I always wished it was the opposite. You know, I want to forget the long-term stuff. See, I'd like to remember what I did yesterday. I don't care what I did 20 years ago. But for some reason, as you get older, something comes to your mind, God, happened 30 years ago. Well, that's a memory. I read an article one time about our memory, and it said in there that if we were to measure our, mem our computer by our memory, the capacity, not what we use it, how we use it, or how much we use it, but it's full capacity, we would have to have a computer as big as Empire State Building. You didn't know you were that smart, did you? Huh? But see, that's a gift from God. It's a gift from God. Now I have a will. Oh, do I have a will. My, my grandmother knew I had a will. She used to call me Cochadas, which is another word for testadura, which is another word for hardhead. <laughs> she had strong will. And every one of us has strong wills. You think you don't, but you do. And that will is so strong that you and I can say no even to God. That's, that's how awesome it is. Well, all of those faculties, which it even in a, in a child especially, are not quite working right. Well, they're still there. They're there. And when you're baptized, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come right within you. See, that child is totally different. So different that the angels look upon it in awe. Isn't that a magnificent thing, huh? They look upon it in awe. When we're confirmed, something else happens to us. Seven gifts become, become active. For example, I need, as I work along with people, I need the fear of the Lord. Now, I don't mean that shaky fear that's scary. I need to know that God is my Father, and I don't want to offend Him. I don't want to make, I don't want to hurt Him. So I keep away from things that are not according to His will. Then I have to have piety. I have to have... A re not only a relationship with God, but I have to have a relationship with you. I have to love my neighbor. I have to love him as God loves him. But well, that's a special gift. It's not easy to love. You say, well, I th love is easy. Well, I don't think it's easy. You think love is easy? No? Nobody doesn't think love is easy. No, you you got emotional love. Yeah, well, that all comes, you know. Dogs have that. You know, you, you see one person comes in, he likes that odor. That's all. Don't, don't kid yourself that your dog knows you. He just likes the odor. Besides, he knows that this person in this blue dress is going to feed me. He's got instinct. If you ever hit him with a broom, every time he sees a broom, he's going to back off. See, but, but you and I love with, with our will. We choose to love. That's why there's so many divorces. Somewhere along the line, when the emotions wore down, they didn't will anymore. You married? Well, I'm asking you. Sure you're married. <laughs> That's a dumb question, wasn't it? How long have you been married? 49 years. 49 years? 
Wow. That's a lot of will, isn't it? Huh? For her? <laughs> but I, it, there is times, weren't there times when you have to really will? You know, you're, you just don't. Do you ever feel like, like he liked it? Give him a swat or something. Yeah? yeah? You did. I can't answer that question. You got <laughs> I But I don't mean to put you on the spot. I'm just trying to prove something. But there had to be some times, and maybe lots of times, when you have to say, yeah, I've, I'm committed. I love this woman. I love this man. And we're going to work through these difficulties, these crosses. See, that's real love. If we only love when we feel good about it, then how will I ever love God, whom I do not see? If I don't love my neighbor, whom I see? I had some person told me one time, well, I find loving God easier than somebody I'm looking at. Well, I don't know. You see, John said that. If I don't love my my neighbor whom I see, how am I going to love God I don't see? Then I have to love God on a will level. It doesn't decrease love now. Love and will are the same. If God calls me to vocation and I say, yes, Lord, and I have to, I have to carry that through, through thick and thin, good and bad, success and failure. Well, it takes a lot of piety and gifts. And the second gift is fortitude. Anybody married 49 years has fortitude. <laughs> you got to have strength. Why? Because you get tired of it all. You know, you get tired of, of doing things. You get tired. On a natural level, we, we don't persevere well. Yeah, I, I need a special grace from God. We call that fortitude. I call it guts. Okay? You need guts to love God, to love your neighbor, to keep on being good in a world that is saying something entirely different. That's fortitude. You got all that at confirmation. Then there's a wonderful gift called counsel that we don't seem to have much of these days. We just seem to wander like cattle, sheep, lost sheep. And, and, and that, that particular gift allows me to discern between the Holy Spirit, the human spirit, and the evil spirit. If more people discerned the presence of the evil spirit today, you wouldn't be in all these crazy things you're in. If we could discern the human spirit, I, we wouldn't always say, well, God told me to do this, and God told me to do that, and God told me to do this. Well, how do you know it wasn't you? I had a woman one time say she was so angry because her husband went down about a motorcycle, and he needed that like a hole in the head. And she asked him why he did. He said, God told me. Oh, I don't know <laughs> if God told him to buy a motorcycle. He said, I don't, I don't know. I don't think he did. Especially when he couldn't afford it. She said, we, we have to discern things. We just can't go around doing these kind of things because we, we want to. Now, before we go to the other three, I want to. I want to take a next call. Hello. Hello, Angelica. Hi. Where are you from? Michigan. Wonderful. We got yeah. people here from Michigan. Uh, Sterling Heights, Michigan. And I'd like to have a request for my daughter. Yeah. She's uh, 31 years old, and uh, they're testing her for lupus disease, oh. and they don't know if she's got it. And she's also got cancer of the cervix. Oh. And uh, about baptism, she has a daughter, nine years old, that's never been baptized, and it's really bothering me. I know. It is a kind of heartbreak, but there you have to trust me. 
And as your daughter gets older, maybe you could talk to her and explain to her that what a wonderful thing it is to be baptized, to be a child of God, to go from darkness into great light. You know, it's, if, we, if we explain things to people, if we explain the wonders of the sacraments, the presence of Jesus, and, and, and that you really want her to be a child of God, I, I don't think anybody would say, no, I don't want that. See, we, we, we don't, we're not enthused over our faith anymore. And, and I know you're crying. Don't cry. Pray for her. And as you, as you spend time with your granddaughter, pray for light. And for your daughter, let's all say a prayer now. Huh? This poor woman has cancer. <clears throat> And now they think she has lupus. So, and take a glass of cold water. And we're going to say a prayer. <clears throat> Lord God, you know this woman. You know her heart, her soul, her spirit. Her body is wounded. Her body is in great need of healing. And her soul. First, give her light, Lord, to see that her daughter needs to be baptized, needs to have that relationship with you that nothing else can give. Needs to have that awareness of being called a child of God. Heal her of this cancer. Manifest to her how wonderful you are. What a, a great God we have. A great healer. Give her that grace to know thee, and through this all, this sickness, to, to be aware of you. Let her call out to you. Let her understand. We do not have here a lasting city. We are called to be born, to live, and to die. But if we know that we belong to you, Lord, all things will go well. We ask this in the name of Jesus, through the intercession of Mary, our Holy Mother. Amen. We have another call. Hello? Yes, Mother. <clears throat> what can I do for you? I have a question. Okay. Um, uh, is there a time limit that you, uh, is bad to wait before you have a child baptized? Um, we have a baby, and we're probably not going to be able to do it till the end of the year. Is that going to be a problem? Well, it's not a problem. It's just that um, uh, you keep the child in darkness all this time. I mean, you, you want to. Is, is there some reason it can't be baptized now? Are you there? You're gone. You know, I was born in April, baptized in September. And you know, you know why I was baptized in September? Because I was waiting for my godparents to come back from Italy. What happened if I died between April and September? But you see, the priest looked at me, my mother said, and said, well, why didn't you wait till she walked? <laughs> now, I'm supposing there is a good reason. I don't know what the reason is. But try not to put off baptism. Because you see, this, this trinity, it's... We need to follow the mandate of Jesus here. He said, we must be baptized. We cannot enter the kingdom unless you're baptized in water and the Spirit. And, and we, need, we need to have our children baptized as early as possible. Early as possible. We know 
and then maybe this is just kind of exaggerated, but um, a woman wrote and said that she had a child, and uh, when the child was born, she had a priest there after he was born and put in a little cradle, you know what they do, and, and he went in there and had it all masked up, and he baptized the baby. And that's what you call quick. But there has to be some kind of time limit, and I, I, that's a long time. There's many months here now that you're waiting, and I, I take it there must be some very serious reason that you would not that you would wait so long. But if you're asking my opinion, if it could be done sooner, I, I certainly I would do that. And there again, you know, you don't have to, the child, it's not a matter of the child understanding, it's a matter of you understanding and your godparents understanding. You see, it says right here, see, right here, it, it talks about, it, the, it is baptized in the faith of the church. See, it's baptized in the faith of the church, proclaimed by you, the parent, the godparents, and everybody present proclaims that this child, you see, is born again. See, it's the faith of the church that enters into this child. And, and that's why it's so important that, that we, see, the children must subsequently be formed in the faith in which they have been baptized. That's where you come in. The foundation for the process being the sacrament they have received. The object of the Christian formation is to which children are entitled, see it says children are entitled to baptism, is to lead them gradually from early, early, early infancy to understand and discern the plan of God for them. See how important that is? It's very important. It says they will be able to ratify the faith in which they have been baptized. And it's the same with confirmation. I mean, I got all kind of little, little ditties here. And I'm going to find one that says confirmation here. Where is it? There's one here somewhere. Well, there we go. I'm trying to find it. Confirmation. I just had it here. Well, I can't find it now. But anyway, in the, in the, in the, um, Here's another thing about traditional doctrine of infant baptism. See, it, 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 here's St. John Chrysostom, St. Jerome, St. Uh, Basil, St. Gregory the Great, uh, vigorously reacted against this negligence and begged our adults never to postpone the sacrament of baptism for their children. Now, confirmation is given at a later age. For some reason, I never figured it out. Nobody ever did either. I was confirmed before I was back before my Holy Communion. I was confirmed in September, and and my first communion was in April. So for some reason, I don't know why. Maybe the bishop just happened to come and said, "Well, let's push this kid in here. She's going to need it." <laughs> But in confirmation, we need to know what we're doing, and that's why we're confirmed at a little later age. I, I become, when we talk about, when we talk about baptism we, and in confirmation, I become a soldier. I'm a child of God at baptism. Now, I am a soldier of Christ. I am to proclaim the gospel at confirmation. So, a confirmation, I get four working gifts. I get fear of the Lord. I have to have that in order to stay away from sin. I get piety so I can love you. I get counsel so I can discern. I get four or two so I can persevere. These we call kind of working gifts. Now, I need this to... to to deal with you, you needed to deal with me. See, after that comes knowledge. 
Now, these three gifts are separate. They, they reflect my relationship with God. Why do I need knowledge? Well, if we had knowledge today, oh, I don't mean knowledge of books. I mean supernatural knowledge. I mean the kind that detaches me from the things of this world. I've told you my favorite meditation was all these squash cars on the flatbed truck. Oh, what a meditation that is. And then last, last, a couple of weeks ago, last week I was in Italy. And by golly, I saw a flatbed truck with squash Mercedes. <laughs> How do you like that? Squashed Mercedes on down the Italian highway, bouncing along. So much for that. I need detachment from myself. I need detachment from the world. I need some kind of detachment from my own will. But God gives me those things. He's not going to let you go out in the world without, without, without an implement to fight with. The other one is understanding. I need to know the scriptures. Some of you don't even know there are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I had a prayer group one time years and years ago, and they were mostly non-Catholics. It wasn't a prayer group. It was a scripture class. And one day I said, I want you to look at Luke 12. Everybody opened it up. Well, they had Luke 12 like that, except two women. I looked at their book, and they were looking at Ezekiel. <laughs> and I said to them, are you a Catholic? <laughs> All my Protestant friends knew where Luke was, see. He said, well, we, we just, you know, it's been a long time. <laughs> but their Bibles were brand new, see. You can tell by brand new Bibles that they're brand new. Gee, they are not dog-eared. You need a dog-eared Bible, which means you've been reading it. And, and see, that gift of understanding the Lord gives me for his word. So I, I grasp the word, I hold it in my heart, and I understand it. See, isn't that wonderful? Did you know you got all that at, at confirmation? I bet you did. You went home, had a piece of cake, and that was the end of it. <laughs> then the last gift you got at confirmation was wisdom. Oh, wow. You know, every day I ask the Lord, if he would give me the gift of wisdom before I die, not that I don't already have it. He gave it to me at confirmation. But I mean, in a very high degree. And that degree of wisdom, where I would see things in this world as they really are. That I would be able to love my neighbor, no matter how much he insulted me, no matter how much he hates me, no matter how much he persecutes me. I would have that love for my enemies. That's wisdom. Right now, sometime, I wish they'd slip on a banana peel, you see. I don't have that wisdom yet. The kind of wisdom that she's got in everything and everybody right now. And, and she's God's in tragedies like earthquakes and hurricanes and tornadoes and, and disappointments and pain. Pain is a, like a, is a giant eraser. Did you ever notice when you have pain, everything else goes by the wayside? You might as well forget it. Charity goes, you get very demanding. Um, love goes, you know, you go, oh, get out of here. I don't want to see your smiling face. Everything seems to go. It's a giant eraser. 
Some people are so sweet and so lovely and so quiet and so, oh, they give you the shirt off their back until they get a cold. <laughs> and they, they turn into something entirely different. It's almost like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and all they got is a stuffy nose. See, we, we, we need that wisdom that gives us a kind of serenity, you know? Wow. Well, let's go on. Do you have any more questions out there? Okay. Now, we're going to look at another a sacrament in this beautiful Vatican document. We're called penance. You can call it confession. You can call it penance. You can call it reconciliation. I don't care what you call it as long as you go. Today, I don't know what, you, what it takes sometimes to get anybody to hear your confession. But it says here, on the night he was betrayed, as he commenced his saving passion, Jesus instituted the sacrifice of the new covenant in his blood. Why? For the remission of sin. And after his resurrection, he sent his spirit to the apostles that they may have the power to forgive or retain. Here we're talking about power of the will. Hmm? Do you realize the power a priest has? It's awesome. You know, it's awesome to think that this man, by ordination, <clears throat> is called by God himself to hold in his hand what is a wafer of bread and a cup of wine. And he says those words of consecration. Suddenly, you know, I think in the morning at Mass, there must be at that moment when every angel in that chapel of ours, all the guardian angels of all the people kneeling there, <clears throat> the guardian angel that prays, the angels that surround the, the blessed sacrament, I think when, when the priest pronounces those words, I think every one of those angels goes, oh, awesome. Wow. Look at that. Look what happened. That's what happened. And then he has that same priest has the power. <clears throat> now I could kneel before and tell him all my sins. Because at that moment, he is Christ. He is not a man. It's Jesus. And I kneel for him, before him, like Peter must have, or Magdalene, or maybe Thomas, because he didn't believe. And, and he says some special words to me. He says, I absolve you. I absolve you from all your sins. It's, it's an awesome time. And I think my guardian angel, when, when he hears that priest say that to me, has to say, oh. Because suddenly, the darkest shadows in me are all gone. And there is a light that is blind. 
Now you talk about power. Do you think a president has power or a king has power or anybody else has power? No. That's not power. The power lies in that man chosen by God to do such a great thing. Unbelievable power. Now, you know what he said to Peter? I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Can you imagine a man having the keys of the kingdom of heaven? Oh boy, those feminists, I bet they're hot tonight, huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. I didn't even intend that, you know. <laughs> I don't even feel ornery tonight. But whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. In obedience to the Lord's command, Peter preached the remission of sins by baptism on the day of Pentecost. <clears throat> you know, on Profession Day, Holy Mother Church says, that when I'm professed, it's like another baptism. In other words, all my sins are washed away. Well, when I was first professed, I said that to my friends and relatives, thinking they would rejoice with me, you know, that I got this new garment. And all of a sudden, I get all kinds of petitions in the, in the mail. And the sisters at the monastery started giving me these little slips of paper all wound up with scotch tape. And they said, here, carry this for me while you're lying there prostrate before the Lord. I had such a pad around me of notes <laughs> that I never felt the floor. <laughs> <laughs> the whole litany of the saints was said, and I never knew I was laying on the floor. But they knew something very special was going to happen. On Pentecost, Peter said, repent, and what else? Be baptized. In the name of Jesus. <coughs> <coughs> this is one of those nights. It's not supposed to be good for you, but I'm stuck. We better go for a break. This Easter season, read for faith, read for truth, read for life by giving yourself the gift of EWTN's National Catholic Register. Easter inaugurates a joyous season of hope and renewal that brings us closer to God. Gain a deeper understanding of His love and providence in reading the Register. Make this Easter season even more meaningful. Try the Register for free today and get it delivered to your home, office, or parish. To get your six free issues, order online at ncregister.com forward slash TV or call 800-421-3230 and mention code TV. Act now to try the register filled with national, world, and Vatican news, interviews, in-depth commentary, and features. That's ncregister.com forward slash TV or call 800-421-3230 and mention code TV. The National Catholic Register. Read faithfully. This month, the Church honors the heavenly graces revealed by Our Lady to the Shepherd Children of Fatima. On May 12th, EWTN takes you to Portugal for a pilgrimage commemorating the message and gifts of the Lady from Heaven in Our Lady of Fatima, International Rosary and Candlelight Procession. Then, on May 13th, 
Join the faithful in prayer and thanksgiving for the Blessed Mother's intercession during Holy Mass in honor of Our Lady of Fatima. You are invited to this two-day event from Portugal. Wednesday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern on EWTN. So, thanks for waiting. You know, these, these, this asthma stuff is a, a gift for me from God. We just have to kind of live with it. Some people are asking a question. Can lay people baptize? Well, let's see what the church says about it. If no priest or deacon is available, this is an emergency now. Say, for example, you just had the baby and you were bringing it home and suddenly in the back of the car it begins to choke and it's beginning to get blue and, and things you realize this ch child is in danger of death. Anyway, any person at all with the intention of doing what is right may and sometimes must administer baptism when there is imminent danger of death or especially if the actual moment of death has come. Well, you have to understand, your lay people just can't go around baptizing little children. If danger of death is not yet imminent, the sacrament ought, if possible, to be administered by a member of the faithful. It is desirable that even in this case, a small community be collected or that at least there be, if possible, one or more witnesses. So we're talking about catechesis, catechetical people, social workers, nurses, physicians, people who really know this child is in danger of death. And <clears throat> I think it's very necessary that we understand this. Now, we're going to take some questions from the audience. We have a phone call. Hello? No phone call. Yet. Okay. So it's, 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 it's important that the child is baptized, but we have to know the church says it cannot be baptized if the person, the parent or guardian, is not going to be raise it as a Catholic and allow it to, to really participate in the church. So you, there are many, many cases that you have to really go to a, a priest and, and see what, what the situation really is and what the solution is. But sometimes a guardian wants the child to be baptized. The parents don't. Well, then at that point, they're going to have to wait. Why is that? Well, you see, you have to be sure that once the presence of Jesus is there and the Spirit and the Father, that child, has to, uh, that child is obliged, and you are obliged, to have that child learn every truth that it is possible to learn. See, and, and we say, well, how can we allow that to happen? What would you happen if everybody was baptized and was never lived as a Christian? Wouldn't that be culpable? Wouldn't that make it worse? So we have to realize it's important that you baptize your children. It's also important that as parents you raise those children in the truths of the church. Because there's so much to learn. Just learn, just think what you learn by, by knowing about confirmation. Think what that child will understand when, when it knows that when it permits sin, it can be absolved, it can be made new again. And don't you, anybody out there tell me kids don't commit sin. You have to be deaf, dumb, and blind. Not to know that these kids, by four years old and five, know more than you did when you were 20. <laughs> and when you know more, you're going to have that tendency to sin more. You, it's, it, you can't. 
kids in the sixth, seventh grade are on drugs already. Don't tell me they don't sin. Don't tell me they can receive communion and four years later go to confession. You, you got to be kidding. I mean, we, we, use the, we arrive at the use of reason, and once you say no, bingo, you did it. Or once you say yes at the wrong time. Twelve-year-old children getting pregnant, and you're telling me they don't sit? Let's, let's look at the church and study these documents. You see this document, and this document is called Vatican Council II. They know where you can go? Write for them. Be informed about what the church really teaches, what the church is really saying in these documents. We're going to pray tonight for a child in West Palm Beach whose parents are fighting all the time. Isn't that the saddest thing, huh? When a child calls up tonight and says, my parents are always fighting, pray for them. I want to pray for Ronald in Pennsylvania, <clears throat> who has cancer. We want to pray for a caller in Florida, whose sister is ill. We're going to pray for a caller from Ohio who's praying for the grace of sobriety. I want to pray for each one of you here and out there in television land for grace, for repentance, for faith and hope and love, for a great renewal in the church. You know what I bet? There are 55 million Catholics in, in America. 55 million. If all 55 million read these two books, oh, what do we have a new church? It would be wonderful. We'd all be striving for holiness. So let's say those, all those prayers. Lord God, I ask you to take into your hands tonight, into your arms, all those I've mentioned, the sick, the lonely, those in Turkey still buried under rubble, those that are cold in all the streets in all our cities all over the world, all the children whose parents are divorced or fighting, quarreling, all those on drugs that can't lift that burden. All the alcoholics that are listening, that want to be delivered so badly. All those who are just without hope. All those that are without faith. Those who have long lost love. For those, Lord, For all those that need our prayers, we ask your grace. <coughs> your grace, your love, your peace, your joy.
order this episode of Mother Angelica Live Classics from the EWTN Religious Catalog web store, log on to EWTNRC.com 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, or call 1-800-854-6316. For more than 150 years, Catholics in the USA have placed their lives, hopes, dreams, and concerns under the special patronage of Mary, the Mother of God. Now, more than ever, we need to join together to turn to her in prayer through the Holy Rosary, to ask for healing in our church. To aid this effort, we are pleased to be offering a unique rosary from Gorelli, featuring a special crucifix with red and blue enamel stars and stripes on the front, and one nation under God on the back. On the center is an image of Our Lady over a map of the United States with Psalm 3312 on the back. Every Hail Mary bead has each state's individual abbreviation on it. This collector rosary is available now at EWTNRC.com for just $36. To order, go to EWTNRC.com and search for item number 19183. The Blessed is the Nation Rosary for America. Order yours today. Every Saturday afternoon from 4 until 6 p.m. Eastern, tune in to EWTN for a solid block of programs that can help you better understand and defend your Catholic faith. First up, it's called to communion with radio's Dr. David Anders. Then at 5, learn about the revolutionary rise of Protestantism and the church's pivotal response in the Reformation. And finally at 5.30, explore the fundamental questions of life and death with Dr. Scott Hahn in Hope to Die. Unapologetically apologetic programming every Saturday afternoon from 4 until 6 p.m. Eastern on EWTN. EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, we bring the pro-life movement together every week. I consider it a meeting place for the pro-life movement where we can all come together every week and discuss strategy, research, the latest polling. Everyone is invited. My favorite stories are when families open up their doors, welcome me into their home, and share their heart with how the pro-life issue has affected them. I've interviewed families who have adoption stories, families with children who have special needs or disabilities. I've interviewed a woman who was conceived in rape and a woman who was raped, got pregnant, and chose life for that child. I am so inspired by the courage of these everyday pro-life heroes. yesterday. Mom's death certainly came as a shock to all of us. In many ways, Mary, we really haven't lost Mom. Now in heaven, she can be with all of us and not be away from any of us. 